Good morning. It is great to see everybody this morning. Uh, it's pretty cool when um, January 31st lands on a Sunday because what better way to spend the final hours of the year than worshiping Jesus, hearing his word, growing together. <clears throat> if you're visiting us today, we're glad to see you. It's always awesome to have neighbors and friends joining us for Sunday worship. Um, and especially a Sunday like this where New Year's is obviously a very important time that causes us to pause, to reflect a little bit, to ask some questions about where we've been and where we're going. It's an important thing to consider, uh, something that everyone probably agrees, mostly even within the church, outside of the church and the surrounding culture. New Year's is a time where people admit the importance of examining your life. Reflecting. Um, Socrates, one of the most important thinkers in history, says this line that we've heard maybe many times, the unexamined life is not worth living. And I think it's a very profound and true statement. The unexamined life is not worth living. And as Christians, if you look at Christian history, the concept of self-examination and evaluation has always been a very important piece of the Christian spiritual walk. We want to be the type of people who, as we are knowing God in his word, as we are knowing God in his ways in the world, we are also knowing self. We're allowing God to shine his light into our hearts and help us to have clarity upon who we are, uh, clarity about what are our struggles, what are our needs. We were talking about it this week with my wife, and she brought up Jonathan Edwards as an example, which is uh, really an amazing example because Jonathan Edwards, who is one of history's America's greatest thinkers and the church's greatest theologians, at age 17 compiled this list of resolutions where he realized as a 17-year-old that he must be clear about what his convictions about life are if he is not going to let his life just pass him by. And he had one of, the, one of his resolutions said this, resolved to guard against the least appearance of evil or suspicious circumstances and to examine and inquire into the true state of my soul at least once every day so that I may be able to discover my sins of ignorance as well as those of intention. So as a 17-year-old, he has this conviction, this awareness. He's saying, I don't want to be blind to what's going on in my heart, and I want to notice the things that I'm doing wrong, even if I'm not fully aware of them at first. So as we're kind of, exam as, we're, as we're going through our final hours of the year and entering the new year, I just wanted to share a couple of biblical concepts, practical tools that we can take with us into the next coming year that help us grow in a biblical sense of self-examination. So the first thing I wanted to say is, you know, I want to invite you guys as you're thinking about the next year and as you're reflecting on the past is to make self-examination an essential part of your spiritual life. There's a lot of things that we will agree that are good, a lot of healthy things around us in life that you're going to always agree, oh yeah, that's a good thing. And if I were to do more of that, that would be good. But it's not essential unless you're actually doing it every day, right? A lot of us will agree that exercise is very good, but many of us show that exercise is not essential, right? All of us will demonstrate that breakfast is essential. Not even if we maybe say, oh, you know, you can skip breakfast, you can live without it. But then you look at your life, you're like, ah, I don't actually believe that. I believe it's essential because I can't live without it. What you do is what shows what you actually believe. Now, when we're talking about examining our hearts, we have to ask ourselves, this is a really great thing to pause and be like, you know, what, what, are, what, are, the, what are my habits spiritually when I'm reading my Bible and praying, if I reflect on the week? What do I do actually as part of my Bible reading? Is it a hasty Bible reading and prayer and then off I go trying to find some little spiritual vitamins, some boost of emotional uh, encouragement and then go off? Or or do you actually pause and reflect and, and, and pray and think, Lord, help me to see what are my problems and struggles this week? 
Help me to see, Lord, what are you doing in my life? What are the things that I'm being ignorant of? This is at the very foundation of a Christian spiritual life. When you look at how the Bible describes coming to faith, going from being a person who does not believe in Christ or a person who is spiritually dead and not knowing God to a person who knows Jesus, follows him, and has spiritual life inside him. First John tells us this is one of the ways we test it. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light and there is absolutely no darkness in him. If we say we have fellowship with him and yet we walk in darkness, we're lying and not practicing the truth. If we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us all sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Notice this, sin as a, as a concept, as a, as a power in your heart, sin is always pulling you away from accurately knowing yourself. Sin is always distorting knowledge of self, of the world, and of God. That's why John describes people who are walking in sin as walking in darkness. They are hiding. They like their sin. They like to live in selfish ambition and desire. They don't want to come to the light and expose the fact that what I'm doing is evil and terrible, and it's going to lead to judgment and destruction. Sin is always pulling us into the, into the area of darkness and shadow where I, I can cultivate an imaginary picture of myself. I can avoid looking at my real problems. I can, I can detach myself from what's really going on in my heart. That's what sin is doing. It's like, you know, a person who is walking in the darkness, a person who does not know Christ. It's like a person who has a big infected, deadly wound on their body and who wants to keep living by just putting more band-aids and pretending it's not there, not looking at it, right? That's what John is saying. You, you have a major problem. You have sin in your life and you're avoiding it. You're not thinking about it. You're not looking at it. You're not dealing with the problem of your relationship with God and you're trying to distract yourself. That, that is the definition of living in sin, living in a delusional view of self. That's what allows you to keep doing sin because logically sin doesn't make sense. Logically, if we are created to know God and to worship him and to walk in his ways, logically the dumbest thing to do is to rebel against God and to be selfish and walk in your own selfish ways, right? So the only way that we can get away with sin is if we have a delusional view of self. And that is what sin does. It pulls us away from the knowledge of God. And, 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 and John is telling us, Coming to Christ and being changed, it's like a person who says, no, I want to come to the light. I want to be exposed because even though there's some discomfort and, and, and scariness in that, God's light flooding my life and exposing my sin is the most beautiful thing. It's so much more, it's supreme to walking in my selfish ambitions because he will set me free from sin. He will set me free from rebellion and guilt. So to know God is to know self. This is the foundation. And so it's part of the Christian life. Healthy self-examination, healthy self-awareness. You see this in 1 Corinthians that Paul talks about one of the most important things we do in our Christian walk. As a church, we come together, we celebrate the, the suffering of Jesus on the cross on our behalf. And we do that by taking the bread and taking the wine and prayerfully receiving that, celebrating the victory that Christ has won on the cross for us. <coughs> and, and Paul is saying, when you come to this activity, this practice that Christians have been practicing for 2,000 years, you have to approach it with a very careful self-examination. Look what Paul says in 1 Corinthians. So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sin against the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself. In this way, let him eat the bread and drink from the cup. For whoever eats and drinks without recognizing the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. This is why many of you are sick and ill among you, and many have fallen asleep. If we were properly judging ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned with the world. Notice he's saying, 
if we, this, the Corinthian church had some problems that they, that they had in the church and they were approaching the Lord's supper with a neglectful heart. They were not examining their lives. And he said, the, you guys are having struggles and some suffering and some pain in your life because you are living in sin. You're not examining your hearts. You're not examining the true state of your soul. And then you're, pr- you're pretending to be Christians. You're acting like Christians. You're partaking in the Lord's supper and you are incurring God's judgment. This is a very scary thing. He says, you need to examine yourselves. You need to, you need to look at what's going on in your heart. Look what's going on in your life. And if you, he says, if we were properly judging ourselves, if we had a a proper self-evaluation going on before the Lord, if we were confessing our sins, if we were welcoming his work in our hearts, he says, we would not be judged. We would not be going through such difficulties. But if we are neglectful, if we're living a Christian life that's unaware, naive, blind, then there's going to be difficult things and bad things happening in your life. Is the practice of self-assessment essential to your spiritual life? Or do you distract yourself away from thinking about what is going on in your heart these days? What are the fears? What are the battles? What are the desires that you struggle with? This conviction filters down to just how you do your spiritual life, right? We, we may say, yeah, I do that and I value that. Um, self-evaluation is one of those things that you, you have to make time. So when you're reading your Bible and praying on a weekly basis, is there concrete time set aside for this, for saying what the psalmist says here? What, what, when Acts read, test me, Lord, and know me, right? Is there time in your week that you regularly reflect on the sermon that you heard that Sunday, is there time in your week where you're, when you're reading your Bible, do you read in a hasty manner where you just try to get a little inspiration and move on? Or are you stopping and pausing and saying, Lord, speak to my heart today. Help me to understand my problems. Is self-examination essential to your spiritual life? Do you notice, do you notice in your life when you start to struggle with maybe new intensifying difficulties or struggles or impulses? Maybe you're you're more angry than usual. Maybe you're more anxious than usual. What is your response? Do you respond by saying stuff like, oh, I just need to be better and believe more and try harder? Or do you pause and think, huh, what, what's, what's been going on in my heart? Why, why have I been so anxious lately? What's, Lord, help me to understand. Why have I been so angry? Why have I been so irritable? Are there parts of your life that you are too afraid to think about? That's another question that kind of penetrates down. Is there honest self-evaluation happening or am I avoiding things? Am I too afraid to think about certain things? Number two, we must rely on God's word and his spirit to empower your self-examination. So if we're talking about self-examination being essential, we must rely on God's word. Um, I remember this thing. I don't know if everybody's elementary school did this, but when I was growing up, our elementary school had the hall monitor program where certain distinguished fourth or fifth graders were allowed to wear a special vest and they given a clipboard and a pen and a stack of little papers called citations. And you get to walk around the hallways and you get to, you get to police other kids who are running in the hall or breaking rules. And I remember that give it that, that, that p- position giving me a sense of power. And, and I remember certain kids writing many citations to many kids, you know, and then doing the same things that they wrote citations for. It's a funny, it's a funny thing. Uh, it's kind of like the fox guarding the chicken coop. You know, it's, it's kids policing kids about breaking rules. We may have a similar concern when we're talking about like, man, I'm called to evaluate my own heart and my problems. And, and I understand that I've made such big mistakes in my life. Um, I can't really trust my own thinking. You know, maybe you've had situations in your life where you've went with your judgment, trusted your judgment, trusted your intuition, and then it landed you into big problems and difficulties. And so you're kind of paralyzed by, you, you feel like you have problems and struggles in your life, but you don't know how to make sense of them because you don't really know how to go about untangling them. 
And you don't trust your own judgment and assessment. And that leaves you spinning your wheels, kind of stuck. Now, it is very true that our own thinking, our own heart, our own mind is flawed, right? We are broken by sin. That means that our judgment, our assessment is flawed. Jeremiah 17.9 says this very piercingly and clearly. Jeremiah says, the heart is more deceitful than anything else and incurable. Who can understand it? He's asking this question. He's saying the human heart, when it is infected by sin and it is skewed and twisted by selfishness and dishonesty and evil, makes that heart untrustworthy and complex and hopeless. It is more deceitful than anything else. We are not capable of discerning our own hearts. We don't have that power. Now, some people struggle with maybe the opposite tendency. Some people are paralyzed by not trusting their own assessment. Other people, and I think a lot of us more fall into this category where we're, too, we're way too confident about our own judgment. We, we, we think we can understand everything about ourselves. If we see a problem in our life and we think, oh yeah, this is why I have this struggle, this and this and this, and I understand, and, and that's it, and that's the end of it. it we, we have this big trust in our own self-assessment. And we pat ourselves on the back thinking, I'm an honest person and I admit my problems and I know what my solutions are. But I think what the prophet says here must land deeper in our hearts. He says, the heart is more deceitful than anything else. Have you ever been hit with this realization that your heart is deceitful, that your heart is capable of self-deception, that we're so sinful and, and untrustworthy that, that if, our, if we're left to our own devices, our own selfish ambitions will lie to ourselves and we believe our own lies. Has it ever landed in your heart like this, this realization like, man, I'm a pretty selfish person and, and my own heart lies to me. I can't untangle my own messes. I will believe my own lies. This is why the prophet says the heart is more deceitful than anything else and incurable. Who can understand it? The following verse, I, the Lord, examine the mind. I test the heart and I give to each according to his ways, according to what his actions deserve. Notice the answer that God gives is, yeah, your heart is really wicked and twisted, but I, the Lord, I, your creator, I examine your heart and I can speak into your heart and to your life. I can tell you the truth about who you are. This is where theologians will talk about the miracle of revelation. This idea that the creator of the universe who made us, he made us with purpose and he communicates to us in a way that is understandable to us. A lot of people today like to, like to say, yeah, there's a creator, there's a force, there's, a, there's some sort of being, higher power, but but the assumption is, oh, we're just down here, little finite people. The idea of us actually knowing this creator and accurately receiving anything from that creator is impossible. We can just live our own lives. Now, it sounds very lofty and humble. It's like, oh, wow, yeah, we're so, we're so dumb. We can't even know God's great thoughts. But masquerading under that is this desire that says, I can't understand God's ways. Therefore, I can do whatever I want. The miracle of revelation is, well, if God is supreme, if he is the creator of all things and supremely wise and powerful and governs all of time and history, then surely God is capable of effectively communicating if that's what he intended. What kind of God is it that is unable to communicate to the creatures that he has created? That's one of the core concepts of the biblical story. God has created and God has created us uniquely receptive, capable to hear his word. And that is such a grace because without his word, we are utterly lost. Hebrews 4.12, when we talk about the Bible, we talk about the word of God, like this is a miracle. The word of God is living and effective and sharper than any two-edged sword, penetrating as far as the separation of soul and spirit, joints and marrows, it is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. 
The word of God is a supernatural force. It's not just empty words or ideas. It is the word of our creator and it has power. It comes into our life and, it, and the author of Hebrews says it cuts us open. It exposes, it shows what is in our hearts. Now that's a little scary for a lot of us and we think, man, that's such a negative word. It judges us, it makes the Bible sound so um, judgmental and heavy and difficult and negative. Well, it just depends on what your definition of, of what you want, right? So uh, a CT scan of your body sounds scary if you don't want to know what kind of disease you have. If you would rather just have cancer and not go into the CT scan and not know what's going on, if you're happier to live in your ignorance, then yeah, you don't want to be exposed. But if you want healing and new life and freedom, then when you hear that says that the word of God pierces and it exposes, you're going to say, yes, I, I want to be healed. I want to be changed and I can't change myself. It's a supernatural process. So the only way we can really know ourselves is if our heart and mind is penetrated with influence by God's word. That's surrounding your life with good, healthy preaching, biblical content and books, but more supremely, it is the Bible. If you want to know yourself and if you do not want to live self-deceived, you must cling to the word of God. You must need the word of God like you need headlights when you're driving at night. We must have this feeling like, man, you know, we, we get into our little religious like ideals where we think, oh man, I haven't read my Bible for five days. I feel guilty. I need to be a better Christian and do this. Then I'll feel better about myself. That, that's not how our mind should think. We should think, man, I haven't read my Bible for, for five days. I, I feel like I'm flying blind. I, I need God's word. I need to go to God's word. I need to stop what I'm doing. I need to spend some time reading Praying, reflecting, and asking God to work in my heart. Because without this, I'm, I'm flying blind. I can't know myself. I can't understand my life. I can't trust myself if there is not a supernatural influence of God's word which comes into my heart and turns the light on. It straightens what is crooked. It gives me the ability to think about my life and to understand. Without God's word in your life, you are flying blind. And if you, don't ha if you don't long to read the Bible, then you don't realize you're flying blind. You think you're fine. That's the truth. You're okay with being self-deceived and deluded. But that's dangerous. What is your posture to the word of God? Do you open this book just to get a little bit of inspiration? Or do you open this book and say, Lord, talk to me. I want to read. I want to understand this truth so that it could help me understand my own heart. What is your posture to church, to, to listening to sermons? Do you listen to sermons and Christian content because you're just trying to get distracted from your life? Or are you listening with that humble posture that the psalmist says, Lord, search me and know me, test me and know my anxious thoughts and see if there's any offensive way in me. That's literally the prayer you can pray every time you sit down to read the Bible. Lord, search me and know me. Help me to see. You must rely on God and his word and his spirit. Number three, <clears throat> we must allow Christian community and church community to help us see our blind spots in our self-examination. So it's interesting in that passage earlier that we read about communion, when Paul says, you guys are approaching communion and you have sin in your life. And this is very dangerous because you are, you are pretending to be walking with Jesus you are receiving his body and his blood. You are declaring your allegiance with Christ, but your life is going in the opposite direction. This is dangerous. And the problem Paul was addressing in that context was disunity in the church. He was saying, you guys are coming together. You're, you're celebrating the Lord. But before church, after church, you got beef with people. You're arguing. You have conflict. You're judging people. You're constantly divided. He said, your status between each other is a signal of what's your relationship with God, that you got problems inside. 
His whole discussion on evaluating ourselves is also connected to how he's looking at the church. And that's because God has created the church this way. God has created us as a community and he's joined us together. He, he brings us together. Why? So that as we live among each other, he speaks to us through each other. He, he works as the word is working in all of us. He is helping to speak through different people in your life where your blind spots are, where the concerning things in your life are, where you need encouragement and strength. God has interconnected Christian life like that. He says that, Paul says this very clearly in Ephesians 4, where he's describing the whole spiritual growth and process, and he says this, Ephesians 4, 15, but speaking truth in love, let us grow in every way into him who is the head into Christ. From him, the whole body fitted and knit together by every supporting ligament promotes the growth of the body for building itself up in love by the proper working of each individual part. So notice he says, Christian spiritual growth, it's like a, it's like a body that's all joined and knit together. And you're, you're growing spiritually when you are all living in community and tightly interconnected with trusting deep relationships and you're speaking truth to each other. And that truth is changing you guys and you're all growing. That is the whole process of spiritual growth. So a simple way to ask, to test yourself, are you growing spiritually? One simple test is not to say, oh, I read my Bible more and I pray more and I go to church more. No, I would say this. Are you more effective and fruitful in helping others grow in Jesus? Are people around you more impacted by your spiritual life than they were last year? That's a very easy way to test our spiritual growth because it's visible, right? As, as for fathers in the home, that's your front lines. You're spiritually ministering in your home. Are you more effective to speak in the truth to your kids, to your wife, being a model, being an example, being a source of grace, guidance, wisdom, patience? Are people around you more encouraged to follow Jesus or less? That's a really clear way to, to see if we're growing spiritually. What are my biggest blind spots? How can I know my blind spots? Well, they're blind to you, right? So the only way you can know them is if you have trusting, deep relationships with, with godly Christians. Trusting deep relationships with godly Christians. This is probably one of the most important things in our life. Godly, spirit-filled Christians. Now, that's an important category because, unfortunately, the church is not perfect, right? There's a lot of people in the church who are not very godly, not spirit-filled. They're not walking in the truth, Maybe there's, there's inconsistencies in their life. Maybe there, there's sins that they're hiding in their lives, right? I, we don't know. But we all have this sense. There's certain people in your life, you have a sense. You look at their life, you're like, man, this person is real. Like, th they're walking with Jesus. They're not trying to make a show of it. They're, they're honest about their sin, their weakness. They're, they're growing spiritually. They're delighting in God's word. Every time I'm around this person, I'm encouraged. I'm empowered to grow in Christ. Those kind of people, those are the people we should be valuing more than anything else in our life. We should, we should want to think, we should want to know what they think about us. Because we know that if they're guided by God, and if we have a good trusting relationship, they can tell me things that I don't see. This is why we value church membership at Living Word. Church membership is so important, because, not because we're trying to keep people on lists and control people, but because... Uh, a lot of people want to have this Christianity where they come to church, they sing the songs, they get a little inspiration, they go back to their life. They don't want nobody to touch them. They don't want to belong to anybody. They don't want Christianity to cost them anything. They just want to do their own thing. That's not Christianity. This is why we try to structure the life of our church in a way that promotes genuine, trusting relationships to grow. That's why we have small groups. That's why we do all these things so that we can grow in community. But you can have all these things around you promoting you to grow spiritually, grow in relationships with people, but you're not growing in relationships with people because you're not taking that step to pursue godly people in your life, to spend time, listen, be humble enough to hear, to value them, to serve people, to love people, give away your time and energy. Your church community will aid you in your self-examination. Now, notice what I'm not saying. I'm not saying we need to be running around telling everybody what they're doing wrong, right? 
That's not what we're saying. I'm saying from your perspective, you should seek people. You should value it, right? If you're not seeking it, people won't tell you things unless it's very clear, glaring major sin issues that need to be dealt with, with pastors. But if you aren't seeking it, people are not going to come to you. Hey man, like I just want to tell you there's some struggles in your life that I'm going to speak to you. Like that's, that's not how relationships work. There's a natural way that trust grows and truth is spoken. And it's also very dangerous for us if you, have a, if you have a habit of blocking people out. If you have a habit, if you see there's a trend of different kinds of people telling you things that, hey, this is really concerning. Like you sh- this thing in your life and you just block people out and you have a bunch of experiences where people have told you things in your life are not healthy and you just block them out and you keep moving. You got to realize that that's dangerous because God speaks through his church. Speaking truth in love, we grow up into him who is the head, into Christ. That's literally the whole Christian life. Speaking truth in love, that's how we grow. So you need to to allow the church to fuel, to strengthen your self-examination. And finally, the fourth point, as we're approaching the end of this year, is um, healthy biblical self-examination. It must lead to somewhere more than just self-examination. It must lead to repentance and change. The whole purpose of the psalmist inviting God into his heart in Psalm 139 is change, right? He says, search me and know my heart, O God, and test my concerns. See if there's any offensive way and lead me into the way everlasting. Lead me into a new way. The whole point of this is change. The end goal of the Christian life is not just to boost our emotions or make us feel better about ourselves. It's it's to live a new life, to have change. And this is really, again, it's one of those like, I think it's one of the most hope-giving things in the Christian faith. One of the deepest questions that we struggle with, if you've had years and years of struggle, addiction, maybe failures in your life, is like, can I really change? I think for a lot of people, New Year's, maybe we we get excited, we plan, we make New Year's resolutions, but maybe deep down there's this lingering, piercing doubt and fear like, man, can I even change? Like, can I actually succeed in all these things? Or can I, or am I doomed by my weaknesses and failures, which I've seen over and over in my life? God says, You can't change yourself. You have no power to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. My grace enters your life. My word enters your life. My spirit works in your heart. You can change. If you're not selfishly blocking my work in your heart. And the thing is, a lot of times we will allow some level of self-examination in our life, but we don't go to the deeper level that leads to change because you know, it's become popular to talk about our problems. You know, if you go on Instagram, everyone's talking about their problems. Everyone's being vulnerable. And we have personality tests and personality types. And we can see, oh yeah, most likely in my relationships, based on this test, I have these problems. Oh, that's so true. I do have that problem and I need to improve in that. And we struggle and we talk about our weaknesses. And The big problem with all this thinking is is it's very therapy oriented, which is to say it's it's very much oriented about the self. The world and its thinking is always oriented about the self. So whatever makes me feel good about myself, that's what matters. So we can talk about our problems and our struggles and our weaknesses and leave it at that because we feel better about it afterwards and we feel like we're honest people and we're dealing with our stuff and move on when nothing has really changed. One way that we catch this is the words we use. So the verbal, the, the verbiage that you use. So we like to say, we like to use the word struggle. We like to use the word weakness. We like to use that we're, we need to grow more, right? These are, these are good words, but you know, they're morally neutral words. They, they, they talk about something that is good, but not essential, Right? You can talk about your struggles and your weaknesses and leave it at that. But when the psalmist is talking to God, he's not just talking about struggles and weaknesses. 
He's talking about sin. Because his whole orientation of change is not, well, I just want to become a better person. No, he's engaging with God. The psalmist is moved by this realization, wow, my whole life is before the face of God. I cannot escape him anywhere I go. God has created me for himself and I live before his face every day. And this God, he is good. He is amazing. He's glorious and gracious and kind. And so the psalmist, the psalmist welcomes God, says, test me and know any offensive ways and change me. He's welcoming God. And he's calling sin, sin. And he's calling it an offense against God. And he's seeking true repentance. One way is we talk about struggles. Another way we'll, we'll dodge this kind of bullet is by making all these um, general statements about how we need to grow. Yeah, I struggle with pride. Oh, I'm a selfish person. I, need to, I, need, I for sure need to work on that. Or I struggle with laziness for sure. Yeah, like we, we feel honest. We feel that that's real. You know, at the end of the day, though, you said nothing because you just put a big old Band-Aid label but you've never actually gone to the depth of, okay, but like, how exactly is laziness infecting my life? And what are the sinful effects of that? And how do I really need to change? Right? We're not doing any of that if we're just doing these general labels. We like to be broad and we like to hide under the broad labels because let's be honest, real change is really complicated. If you're struggling with a relational issue, if you're struggling with tension in your life, in your marriage, in your family, with yourself, about your sinful habits, if you start to really look and say, man, why do I struggle with these things? And you start to think, man, what does change actually look like in this area of my life? You start to realize that it's complicated. It's really complicated. It's slow. We're slow to change. It takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of work of thinking, man, if I'm constantly getting into arguments with my wife over this issue, why is that happening? Well, let's think about it. Why am I always getting super defensive when my friends ask me about this part of my life? It takes a lot of work to think, to reflect, to learn, to change. And we like to dodge all of that by by putting on this label that says, oh yeah, I struggle. I'm, pr- I'm a prideful person. I need God's grace. Yeah, you do. But that didn't get you anywhere by saying that. Real self-examination, it leads to repentance. And repentance is always specific. That's why he, the psalmist is saying, there's problems in my heart that I'm not fully aware of, Lord, and I want you to examine me. I want you to test me. And I want you to expose these problems And I want you to help me change in these areas. He's involving God in a complicated process of change. And notice this. The true motivation for repentance and change, it's not guilt. The psalmist is not saying, I'm afraid to go to hell and I'm just so guilty of all my sins. Therefore, that's it. Yes, fear and guilt are important. We need to be, feel guilty over our sins and we need to be afraid of going to hell. But the deeper motivation for true repentance in the Bible is always a desire to run to God because we see how good he is. We see how God is so much better than our sin. We see how knowing Jesus and being transformed by his, his grace and making me part of his family and setting me on a new course of life, living for his kingdom at, and not my own, This life is so much better than my selfishness. Real repentance is about running into the warmth of God's love and light. Yes, it's uncomfortable, but that's our greatest joy because we find that to be the safest place. We find him to be the only healer who can change our hearts. Selfish, human-centered ways of change is I need to change. Yeah, I need to change. I need to be a better person so that God can accept me, so that others can accept me. Gospel change says God has loved us when we were sinners and he has given his life for us. He has entered into the world. He has become a man. 
He has taken all the burdens of our sinfulness and he has, though he has lived a perfect life, he has stood before God to face all of judgment in our place to wash our record clean. That's what Jesus did. When we understand that, we we have this desire with the psalmist to invite God and say, wow, you are so good. You are so much better than my sinful ways. Lord, teach me, know me, examine my heart. I'm not afraid of you exposing me because you love me and you're so much better than anything I could dream for myself. This leads to clear confession of sin. Confession of sin says, look, it's specific. I'm struggling with anger and pride and selfishness because I very much prize my quiet downtime in the evening. I want to be on the couch. Nobody is to bother me. And I'm selfish about that. Lord, help me. I want to confess that selfishness. That's wrong. It's toxic. It's destroying my family. Lord, teach me to be a giving, loving person in my family at that time. Teach me to be, my heart to be full of the love that you've given me. Help me to cut out that sin and walk in your ways. Walk in your light. It's specific. Real repentance is specific. And it's turning away from old ways, turning to God, welcoming his ways. Search me, know my God, and know my heart. Test me, test me and know my concerns and see if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. As we're wrapping up this year, a couple of questions for you to examine yourself today. Maybe spur on some self-examination. Is there real self-examination happening in your life? Do you generally just kind of run through life, lots of distractions, lots of things going on, a lot of noise, helping you tune out your inner problems? Are you that kind of person? Do you rely on God's word and the work of the spirit in your life to expose your heart in new ways? Do you trust your own assessment? Do you trust your own assessment? Or do you look at your problems and think, man, why do I struggle with this? Well, I think it's because of this, but I could totally be wrong. Lord, Lord, help me to see. Lord, I need to get into your word. I need to spend time reading the Bible, meditating, praying. I need to spend time with other Christians, speaking into my life, testing me, because I don't trust my own deceitful heart. Do you value and pursue trusted relationships with godly people in your life? Is that something that you intentionally seek? And maybe there's some specific ways God is poking you to examine yourself today. Maybe there's some specific ways that the Holy Spirit through this word is, is challenging you. Stop hiding in the darkness. Maybe you don't know Christ. Maybe you know, as you're listening, you know that you don't know God's love. It's an invitation. God is always inviting. He is good. Inviting to come, to trust, to turn away from sin, to discover newness of life in him, to be rid of guilt and fear. Maybe there's specific areas, habits in your life that God is exposing as you're moving into the new year. Welcome him with that open posture and say, Lord, test me and know me because in your shining light, that's the safest place I could be. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you are a God who is so much more present in our lives than we even realize. We thank you that you are a God who is so much more patient, so much more good and kind than we even realize, Lord. We want to come to your light today, Lord, as your people. We want to confess our sins. We want to confess that so often we get wrapped up in our distractions and our anxieties. Lord, so often we are too afraid to sit still, to receive your word, to receive the work of your spirit in our hearts, Lord. Lord, teach us to to welcome your work in our hearts. Teach us to be the kind of people who are not hiding in darkness, but coming to your light. Lord, we thank you that you are the great healer. You are the great physician. You are the one who comes into the world, into a dark and sinful world to speak light, to speak life through your word. We thank you for your word. We thank you that we can be here today to hear from you, not to hear from our own thoughts and our own imaginations, Lord. We pray that you would make us a gracious people, a people who walk in your light, a people who are light to others. As we're going into this year, Lord, help us to be a community of people who are passing on the light of your word, who are 
full of your grace and truth which exposes in an uncomfortable way and yet heals in such a beautiful and loving way. Teach us to be those kind of people, Lord. We praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen.